So, um, welcome back to part two of phenotyping and the challenges of phenotyping. And, and what I want to concentrate on over the next half an hour is, is, is to build on all of the features and themes that I tried to get across to you in uh, the first talk and to tell you about the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, IMPC, building the first comprehensive functional catalogue of a mammalian genome. And you'll, you'll have already heard a bit about this from uh, Michelle when she talked about data analysis, which of course, now we're moving into not doing hundreds of genes, but thousands of genes. And that, therefore the extent of the data and the analytical tools that are required uh, are cor correspondingly larger. So, um, but what I want to do is get over the, one of the critical lessons is that we can now do this. We can take mutations in every gene in the mouse genome and find out comprehensive information about its phenotype, which gives us a fundamental new database where we know something about the function of every gene in the genome, and usually quite a lot. And that, of course, is going to be an important tool for us to understand not only genetic mechanisms, uh, but disease mechanisms as well. Um, now, this is a, given the scale of the project, given the effort that's required, this, we've now moved from just being a European consortium, but to a global international consortium. And these are all of the centers worldwide that are involved with the, the project. As you can see, there are many in North America. Of course, there are many in, in Europe, spread across Europe, but many in Asia as well, all of whom are contributing data and ideas uh, to the future of the project. And let me just remind you again of the context in which we're doing all of this large-scale mouse functional genomics. And that is that the function of the majority of genes in the mouse and human genomes is still unknown. It's extraordinary. You can go to PubMed and from many genes you can find virtually no hits at all. Nothing about their function, their relationship to disease or whatever. And just by looking at a gene, we're remarkably poor at predicting the function of genes. And in particular, the pleiotropic functions, the multiple functions of genes in different tissues. It's often impossible for us to gauge what a gene might be doing what's its genetic mechanisms, and how it might be involved in disease, simply by looking at its structure, the motifs that it's got, and the other proteins that it interacts with. And as I've already alluded to you, we've only generated knockouts until IMPC came along for about 30% of mouse genes, and the data for that gene, that legacy of data that we have is very patchy. It's entirely dependent on the interests and experience of the investigator who looked at that particular knockout. So, as I reiterated in my first talk, we need to develop approaches for broad-based phenotyping that will provide us with a comprehensive picture of genes and genetic networks. And there's a wider resonance, particularly with the human and clinical genetics community that I think all of you will be particularly interested in. If we look at the big human genetics programs that are going on, there's huge programs capturing uh, genes that are involved with rare disease, and it, it, I, we have an ongoing program in Mendelian disorders. It's important that when we have a gene that's associated with a rare disease or a Mendelian disorder, that we look at the function in the mouse, we generate a mutant, we validate what's seen in the human population, and we also have a disease model uh, that allows us to um, understand more about the genetic mechanisms of that particular disease. Many of you will be aware of the Precision Medicine Initiative in the States. In, there's an equivalent initiative in the UK called the 100,000 Genomes Project. And other large-scale human genetics programs where we're analyzing the genomes of hundreds of thousands, probably in the future millions of people, <coughs> looking at their genetic variation and relating it to the phenotypes uh, that they display, in particular disease phenotypes. And these projects will be informed by all of the information that we provide on the mouse, making mutations, providing information on the function of the genes, additional alleles, uh, but generally relating gene to function, validating the gene phenotype relationships that we think we've found in the human population. So this synergy between mouse and humans is absolutely critical 
for the future of precision medicine and disease medicine in general. And going back to a question that I, um, I had earlier on uh, uh, from the first talk, the opportunities for big data studies are going to be enormous as well. So from all of these um, human disease initiatives, we're, we're producing a huge slew of multidimensional genetic and phenotype data. And we need to interrelate that human data to the mouse data that's coming from IMPC and other programs, where we uh, synergize and, and have a, a crosstalk between all of the multidimensional data sets that we're <coughs> generating in both those species. So what is IMPC about? It's obviously to undertake broad-based phenotyping of 20,000 mutants, again from this International Knockout Mouse Consortium resource. Has to be a coordinated activity of mouse centers worldwide. We couldn't do it in one place alone. And it's occurring in two phases. Phase one, which is now complete, was a development phase where we phenotype up to 5,000 genes. And then phase two, where we try and tackle the remainder of the genome. Phase two is just beginning, funding is in place, and I'll tell you a bit more about that later on. All of the data that's being produced as we generate the mutants and we phenotype them, all the data is freely available through a data coordination center that I think Michelle probably mentioned yesterday. The data coordination center is actually at our institution in Harwell, where many of us are, are from. And all of the mice are freely available as well through a global network of mouse repositories that are associated with the centers where we're carrying out this program. So, um, I, I won't belabor this again. Uh, this is just to reiterate the design of the mutant allele. Uh, from the embryonic stem cell lines that were created by the uh, International Knockout Mouse Consortium, they've made more than 15,000 of these. It's a knockout first conditional ready allele. Uh, and the allele that we actually phenotype in IMPC is this allele here. It's a completely null allele. We've excised by this Cre excision here one of the critical exons within the gene but it still has a reporter molecule. So the gene splices into this LAXE reporter molecule so we can follow the expression of the gene and I'll come back to this later on. Important, all of these embryonic stem cell lines were made in uh, a, an, a genetic background called black 6 n And all of the mice that we use in IMPC are black 6 n So all of the mutations are on a purebred isogenic background. There's no genetic variation in the mice at all. And this, of course, is important in ensuring that we get robust and reproducible, heritable phenotype. So, uh, this is the IMPC phenotyping pipeline. It's rather busy. You'll see that there are two components to it, an embryonic component and an adult component. I'll come back to the embryonic <coughs> phenotyping later on. But suffice to say that mutations that are homozygous lethal and obviously die before birth, they're going to go through the embryonic phenotyping pipeline to find out where they die and what they die of. In the adult phenotyping pipeline, from uh, 9 to 16 weeks, we have a variety of tests that all of the mice go through. And then uh, there are a number of terminal tests, such as clinical chemistry, blood measurements, heart weight, and so on, that are done uh, after 16 weeks. Let me just point out a couple of features. Uh, just as with Eumodic, all of the analyses are done on seven males and seven females. So we capture sexual dimorphism, and I'll come back to that later on. Uh, we obviously measure fertility and, uh, importantly, viability. And, as I said, homozygote lethal lines go through the embryonic phenotyping pipeline. But we also, if, they, if we do have a homozygous lethal mouse, uh, the heterozygotes go through the adult pipeline as well, just as, as with Eumodic. We capture gene expression data because, as I said, we're using this allele that's got a LACZ reporter in. So we look at embryonic expression at 12.5 days of embryonic development. And we also look at adult LACZ expression patterns as, as well across a whole <coughs> range of tissues. So we're not only capturing phenotype information, neurological, behavioral, and so on, we're actually capturing gene expression information. Now, I think one thing that's important to note is that uh, and I think this is quite a useful slide. This just summarizes all the tests that we're doing in the uh, IMPC pipeline, and it relates those to particular systems areas on which those tests impinge. 
And as you can see, we cover a whole lot of different systems areas, some more deeply than others. But it shows that we are trying to run a comprehensive phenotyping pipeline that will discover as much as we can about the function of a gene in diverse uh, systems. So I'm sure Michelle showed you this slide. Um, uh, but just to reiterate, uh, we have 10 centers around the world who are actually generating knockout mice and generating phenotype data on them. And they all deposit their data uh, through the internet in the DCC at Harwell, where it undergoes data validation, QC checks, uh, before it goes on to statistical analysis and deposition in the core data archive uh, at the EBI. Uh, so we have a phenomenal data collection and curation program, and, and Michelle's already talked to you about the, the number of tools that we've developed all the way from data validation to QC tools to uh, statistical analysis, and I won't go into, into those in detail. But suffice to say, this is where we are as of a few weeks ago. I updated this slide a few weeks ago. We've done over 10,000 ESL microinjections, and almost certainly we've hit now 6,000 genotype confirmed lines. These are robust, highly QC mouse mutants. They are what they say on the tin. Uh, and uh, uh, from those 6,000 genotype confirmed lines, we have now nearly 4,500 lines with phenotype information. And before Christmas, we did a data release. This was data release 5.0 on uh, around 3,500 lines. So already, you can see that if you compare with the Eumodic project, we've gone up a log scale in terms of the amount of information uh, and uh, genes that we've been uh, analyzing. And this is really multi-dimensional big data. Michelle probably said this as well, but I think it's worth reiterating. We have nearly 6,000 genes. We have nearly 40 million data points, 3,500 images, all collected from these 10, 10 institutions around the world, all coming into a central database for analysis. And I, I know because Michelle went through this, I'm not going to dwell on this for very long because she showed you the website. I exhort you to go and look at it and just dip into it. It's a now it's already a mine of information where every day you can find something new. You can search by genes, you can search by phenotypes, you can search by uh, homologues of uh, human disease. So you can start with the human disease and find out is there a mouse model for my human disease, either on the basis of phenotypes or orthologous genes. So it's incredible. Now this is a, I don't know whether Michelle showed this, but I love this example. Come back to LMOD1, remember that gene that I talked about in my first talk? So LMOD1 has been through the IMPC pipeline, and LMOD1 is one of these genes that, uh, until not long ago, uh, had no PubMed hits in at all. It's now actually got six, uh, but it's what some people call the dark matter of the genome, the ignorome. The, the most of the genes, as I've already said, we don't know anything about. Robert Williams, in a paper in PLOS One a number of years ago, called this the ignorome, and he actually mentioned this gene, LMOD1. It's highly expressed in the brain, but at that point, no PubMed hits. What on earth did it do? It's expressed in the brain, it's expressed in other tissues. What does it do? Well, in fact, when you put it through IMPC, it's got a whole slew of phenotypes. And if you go and look at the phenotype heat map in IMPC, you can see that it's got nervous system phenotypes, limb, digits, adipose, metabolism. It's <coughs> death as well. It's a death gene. That's one of the PubMed hits that's now come out on it. Growth phenotypes, cardiovascular behavior, skeleton, immune system. And you can, one of the great things about the IMPC database is that you can click on one of these and you can drill down through PhenoView to the raw data and you can look and see precisely what was the data that we recovered. So this is LMOD1, but here's, uh, this is for acoustic startle. And not surprisingly, because these mice are deaf, they have no acoustic startle whatsoever. They're flat lining at the bottom. Here's the control data, these beehive plots here. Here's the individual data for the individual mice that were analyzed. You can go and look at all sorts of other data. You can drill down to see the x-ray images for each mutant. You can go and look at, as I 
mentioned in my phenotyping pipeline, you can look at the lag Z expression pattern. This isn't actually LMOD1, this is another gene, I don't, can't remember which one, but with this beautiful pattern of expression in the cerebellum in, in the brain. So go and, go and play with it. It's, it's a beautiful database, there's fantastic information, and it will often tell you about something about your favorite gene that you always wish to know about and, and never knew. But it's all based around, I just want to emphasize it again, delivering reproducibility. We can't do these uh, projects without standardization and assessment of baseline data, validation of tests, robustness through reference lines, and analysis of the test variances to, to elucidate where we can improve uh, the function of each of the, um, uh, uh, the, the phenotyping tests that, that, that we carry out. So, what I'm going to tell you now about is, so what's the impact? What do we actually find out when we do all of these analyses? What are the novel features of the mammalian genome landscape? And I want to go through each of these in turn and just tell you, give you a little vignette about novel insights into gene function, the extensive new collection of disease models and new candidates disease genes, <coughs> The extraordinary results around sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism is pervasive and way beyond what we ever expected. Uh, opportunities for the identification of new gene and phenotype relationships, which will allow us to explore new genetic and disease mechanisms. And finally, which we were talking about before in the, in the questions, insights into human disease from the analysis of mouse lethal genes, or what people sometimes call essential genes. So, <clears throat> Insights into uh, novel gene function. Let's have a look at that. So, not unsurprisingly, this is an analysis that was done. It's now out of date, but the, the, you get the same results if you do it with the, the new data. This was from the first 1,000 genes analyzed through IMPC. They had 3,500 phenotype in annotations, and you can see that extensive pleiotropy is revealed. There are many genes with multiple phenotype calls on, on that gene. So it's the same as we saw in Eumodic, but nevertheless, that, that's still very important. And also, we see phenotype calls across all sorts of different biological and disease systems. Some more than others, but nevertheless, uh, there are always significant hits in any particular disease system that we look at. Now, we can look at this in a different way. We can look at all of our data as a sort of uh, a plot against normal control data. This, this is um, uh, body mass, body BMD, body mass index data. And uh, normally this would, uh, if control data would be around 100. And this is basically plotting all of the mutants, a huge plot. Of course, you can't see individual points on these apart from the ones that are marked. Here's the uh, HEP data here, nominally wild type, we're assuming. And here's the knockout uh, data here. And you can see that you get many genes which are outliers. These are the ones that we call the phenotypes on. <coughs> I've marked some of these out here because these are novel genes that have never been associated with body BMD before. So here's just another example. This is glucose tolerance test. This is the area under the curve. We can see outliers again here. Some of them never been associated with um, uh, abnormalities in glucose homeostasis. Again, these are the phenotype outliers that are giving insights into novel genes that are involved with particular uh, biological pathways. And it's a solitary point, but at that point, and the numbers still hold up, as I'll come on to later, when we took that first thousand genes, over 600 of them had phenotype annotations, had never had a reported phenotype before. So even if the gene had been looked at, there was no reported phenotype associated with it. So for over 50% of the genes that we're looking at, we were the first group to provide novel and distinct phenotype uh, information uh, about that particular gene. So this just shows the power of what we're doing. We're uncovering that dark matter of the genome, the ignorome, uh, which hitherto had never been explored. So let's, let's just go back to um, our phenotyping pipeline. I'll just give you a more, if you like, cogent example of how that works. 
And it relates again to the area that I'm interested in, the genetics of deafness. What, what is the genome landscape of genes that are involved with deafness? We know quite a lot of deafness genes, but how many are undiscovered? What's that dark matter out there that we've never really looked at before? So some of you will have noticed that at week 14 here, we do an auditory brainstem response, which is a very robust test for deafness in, in, in the mice. Uh, and uh, in fact, because it is a very robust test and because it's reasonably time consuming, we only do it on two males and two females, four mice in, in total. And what we do is we monitor the response of the auditory nerve in this test to various pure tones at 6, 12, 18, 24, and 30 kilohertz, as well as a, a white noise click. And basically what this tells us is about whether the mice have any hearing loss and whether it's low frequency hearing loss or high frequency hearing loss or, or both. So it gives us a real insight, a very similar <coughs> test is used on, on humans uh, uh, into whether the mice are deaf, deaf or not. So we've analyzed ABR data from over 3,000 lines now. And this just summarizes uh, months of work. But in total, we found that there were 67 of the lines uh, that showed very significant uh, raised auditory thresholds. They were deaf. They had a significant hearing loss. 15 of those were known deafness genes. Here are the genes here and here, although for two there were known genes involved with deafness in humans, but we're producing mouse mutations for the first time. But the startling result is that 52 of them, 80% or more, were novel deafness genes. They'd never been associated with deafness before. So what that shows is that the auditory landscape, the mammalian genome landscape that's involved with auditory function, is much, much bigger than hitherto we thought. So not only does this provide a whole new collection of candidate genes for exploring deafness in the human population, but it gives us a whole new window, a whole new perspective on the number of total number of genes in the mammalian genome that's involved with auditory function. And if you do the calculations, it suggests there are about six or 700 genes that are involved with auditory function. So this is the kind of impact that these large-scale projects can have. So let me move on to the next point. We have an extensive new collection of disease models coming out. And I'll just give you a summary of an analysis that was done on release 4.2. This was about 2,500 genes at that point, sometime last year. And we looked at all the human disease genes with IMPC phenotypes. So in fact, from those 2,500 genes, there were about 650 genes which were known to have uh, um, uh, some disease annotation in either OMIM or Orphanet. Rare disease genes associations which had a corresponding mouse or ortholog with IMPC phenotype data. So if we look at those 650 new disease models, 262 recapitulated at least one of the human clinical phenotypes that we were very pleased about. 199 of these had never had a mouse mutant before, never been made, never been looked at. Again, that shows you that we're providing resources and insights which hitherto has not been available. And again, if you look at this figure, if you look at the whole of two, these 2,500 genes, again, over half of the genes had never had a mouse mutant made before. So we would have known nothing about it at all. And of course, most of those genes will have some phenotype annotation attached to it. So I, um, I think um, Michelle went through this yesterday. This is just an example very quickly to remind you. I won't dwell on it. But of course, you can go into the IMPC database and you can look up your favorite uh, human uh, uh, disease. You can see whether it's got a gene associated with it in the human. You could then go and look at the mouse gene and see what kind of phenotype it has. This is bernard Soulier syndrome, which is a platelet disorder. You can drill down into the phenotype database and you can uh, look at the, the mouse model produced in IMPC. It hadn't been produced in MGI before, but it's now been produced in IMPC. And does the phenotype correspond? Well, this is a, an index of uh, phenotype correspondence between mouse and human, 74.82 is pretty high. And many of the phenotype features that we see in the human disease 
which include uh, platelet problems, thrombocytopenia, abnormal bleeding, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are replicated in, in the mouse model as well. I'll just give you another example, bardet beetle syndrome. This is a complex syndrome that involves a number of different genes. bardet beetle syndrome 5 gene uh, <coughs> underlies uh, some of the bardet beetle syndrome cases in human, but a mass mutant had never been made before. We've now made it. This is, in fact, one of the mutants that was made at Harwell as part of INPC. bardet beetle syndrome phenotypes, they include <coughs> learning difficulties, diabetes, ataxia, there have been, as I said, no previously published mouse model, but our mouse model has got many of the multiple pleiotropic phenotypes that you see in the human disease, including uh, ataxia, gait abnormalities, uh, abnormalities of glucose homeostasis, the mice are obese as well. A very good model for uh, Barty Beagle syndrome 5. I mentioned sexual dimorphism. Because we're analyzing both males and females, we can ask how often does the phenotype vary between uh, males and females? And the fact is, uh, a considerable number of the parameters that we measure across all different systems uh, are variable between sex. And of course, this is a very important thing to, to take into account in terms of our understanding of disease and the thera therapeutic opportunities. I'm summarizing a whole paper's worth of uh, information here. But first to note that if we look at the IMPC data, simply sex is a biological variable by looking at our control mice that uh, we use uh, and we put through the pipeline all the time, you can see that even control mice vary between uh, uh, males and females, both for what we call categorical phenotypes and continuous phenotypes. More in the continuous phenotypes, you can see that around 30% of the parameters we measure in control mice show a, a male a phenotype that's greater than a female and, and vice versa. Of course, there are large numbers of parameters we measure where there's no sex effect detected in control mice. But sexual dimorphism is pervasive even in control mice. But there is a sex role in the genotype effect as well. So this is the analysis of the mutants uh, by sex. And you can see that again, there's a significant number of um, genotype effects for categorical variables, but a much uh, bigger effect for continuous variables. You can see that um, uh, we have genotype effects where one sex is affected where, and the other sex is not. Importantly, we have a very significant number of parameters showing a genotype effect uh, in some of the mutants which go in different directions. The male goes, has a phenotype going in one direction and the outlier in one direction, the phenotype is going in the other, the other direction. So this was a big surprise to us, and we hope to have a big paper coming out on this um, quite soon. But it shows the importance of looking at any phenotype in the context of uh, our sex. So I want to um, uh, conclude most of my talk by talking about a little bit about um, insights into human disease from the analysis of mouse, mouse lethal genes. And I exhort you all to go and look at the um, Big Nature article <coughs> that appeared in uh, the autumn. It's easy, easy enough to find, um, uh, which in fact gives you a very detailed exposition of all the data that I'm going to show you in, in the next few slides. But clearly, as I've already mentioned, it was the case in pneumonic, it's also the case in IMPC, a very large number of lines around 40% are either lethal or sub-viable as homozygotes. And the question for us was, what are those phenotypes? Why are they dying in, in utero? And for those genes, how do those genes relate to what we see in the human population in terms of disease genes? And that's really what this paper, paper was about. So let me just expand on that. So in terms of IMPC, uh, we have a common structured characterization pipeline for embryos and embryonic lethals. So we intercross our heterozygotes. Uh, if they're viable, they go through into the adult pipeline. If they're not viable, they're embryonic lethal, the heterozygotes will go into the adult pipeline. But then those uh, uh, homozygotes will be analyzed uh, at E12.5, mid-gestation, we're going to look at gross morphology, 
Uh, we're going to uh, look at viability at that particular stage. If we find that they're not alive at E12.5, we go earlier. If they are alive at E12.5, we'll probably go later. And we use a variety of morphological investigations and also 3D imaging techniques to look at what's going wrong with the embryo uh, during gestation. And all of this work is happening at the major centers across the world to analyze at what time do the embryos die and what are they dying of through a variety of morphological and imaging investigation. So this summarizes the main points for the paper. From this, this analysis was done on the first 1,700 or so lines that were produced by IMPC. And it, it, the analysis was of around 410 lethal genes from those first 1,750 lines. It's worth saying that of those 1,750 lines, in all categories, about 40% of this gene <coughs> is normal. There were genes that had never been looked at before in, in mouse. We found that the lethal genes had a high concordance with human essential genes from cell culture studies. So there's been a lot of work in human genetics to knock out genes in human cell culture and ask, do the cells survive or not? So there was a high concordance between our lethal genes in mice and human essential genes. I don't think that's totally surprising, but it was important to know. The 3D imaging that we carried out on all of these embryonic lethals provide a whole slew of additional phenotypes that are missed by simple gross inspection of the morphology. And last but not least, I'll come back to this, we found that incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity, given we had a uniform genetic context, was very prevalent uh, in our lethal genes. And this is manifested by the fact that 10% of all the lethal genes were what we call sub-viables. That is that sometimes a few mice made it to birth and beyond. Now why is that? Why would most of them die in utero? They're genetically identical. There's no difference between them in terms of their genes. Why do they get through and go on into adults? Very strange. So in total from the 1751 genes, just to remind you again, 1100 or so were viable. 410 were lethal, but there's this big class uh, of uh, sub-viable lines. Well, let's have a, bit, a look at that point in a bit more detail. So this just shows a couple of mutations. Just focus on the uh, images of the, the embryos here. These are obviously light images. These are uh, micro-CT images here. Here are three mutants. Just look at how variable they are. Uh, in terms of their uh, gross morphology. Here's the wild type here, normal. This one looks pretty normal. This one looks uh, highly mutant, large amount of dysmorphology, both in the cross-section and in the overall micro-CT view. Another one here that varies from, from these two. So this is what we call variable expressivity in genetics, and we don't understand it. We don't really understand it. They're genetically identical. These are like identical twins. And yet, they're manifesting phenotypes that are quite different on the basis of the mutation that, that we've introduced. Here's another example here, another gene, where visibly you can see a very severely malformed uh, embryo, a relatively normal embryo here. So we've done some analysis on this because, of course, one class of this um, variable expressivity that I mentioned is the sub-viable class. These embryos where some of them seem to manage to get through embryonic development, they get born and they survive pretty well. And if we look at the uh, percentage of genes without a parallel in the different classes, viable, sub-viable and lethal, you can see that lethals tend not to have paralogs, but most importantly, sub-viable genes are more likely to carry a paralog than lethal genes. Now, paralogs are where you have a related gene in the genome. It's related to the gene that we've knocked out, and it may be buffering the effects of the mutation, allowing these, some of these animals to survive through sub-viability into adulthood and beyond. So again, go to the paper to read more about this, but it gives us a first window 
into this variable expressivity, why it occurs and why we get this class of sub-viable animals where some die in, the, uh, in utero, others proceed to birth and, and, and beyond. Now, last but not least, we also looked at how do all of these lethal and sub-viable genes relate to human disease genes. And this is perhaps the most astonishing story that comes out of this paper. Because what we found is that human disease genes are enriched for essential or lethal orthologs in the mouse. If you have an embryonic, if you have a gene in the mouse which is embryonic lethal, it's much more likely to be a disease gene in human. And I don't mean that it's going to be a disease gene that's embryonic lethal in human. It could be an adult disease. The figures are very compelling. I, I won't go through them in detail here. This is the, the difference between uh, the likelihood that you will be a disease gene for an embryonic lethal set against a non-embryonic lethal. This is the total class here. These are highly significant differences. So that's the most profound point that comes out of this paper. If we have a gene that's embryonic lethal and therefore is <coughs> essential in mouse, it's much more likely to be a disease gene in human. That gives us a new window into human disease genes. They're embryonic lethal in mice, and we're gathering these all the time. It's likely to be a disease gene in human. We can obviously use that information to go and explore in patients the potential role of that gene in human disease. So those are some of the vignettes of what we've been discovering so far in IMPC, but what, what about the future? Well, our, muta our mut mut mutagenesis pipeline for IMPC is now changing. In phase two, we're now moving from embryonic stem cells to using CRISPR-Cas9 to deliver uh, sophisticated alleles for analysis in our, our phenotyping pipeline. We're further enriching the phenotyping pipeline. Uh, and not unsurprisingly, we're now introducing an aging component to our IMPC pipeline. I'll come back to that in a moment. And of course, there are many developments in data and data analysis that um, I'm sure Michelle uh, elaborated to you. But in terms of CRISPR progress, uh, we're now really flying. We've done many microinjections uh, of nearly 900 unique genes. We have nearly 600 genotype confirmed lines that have been generated by CRISPR. Many lines now with, with phenotype information. So our CRISPR mutagenesis pipeline is, is really rolling. Phenotyping, I've already mentioned that we're introducing an aging uh, phenotyping pipeline uh, to IMPC where a large number of the lines that we generate are not just going to be uh, phenotyped in the juvenile stage of adulthood, but where we're going to age out the mice as well. And just to give you a little uh, um, uh, elaboration of this, here's the early adult pipeline for 9 to 16 weeks that I, I've talked about. And what will happen is that some mice will be taken for tissue collection and pathology at the end of 16 weeks, as we already do. But most of the mice will be left on the shelf for another year. We can do tests in this window as well, additional tests. And then they're all going to be re-phenotyped uh, at uh, about um, 13, 14, 15 uh, months of age. So we can not only look at early adult phenotypes, but we can look at late adult phenotypes uh, as well. And those late adult phenotypes, as I mentioned in my previous talk, are going to give us an additional window on the function of genes by eliciting uh, new and novel phenotypes. So, to conclude, um, well, I've actually got the wrong slide here, but uh, <laughs> IMPC has delivered 5,000 mice lines already. We've, we've done phase two. Uh, our phenotype data from over 4,000 phenotype lines is now available, and we're, we're well into phase two now. And uh, as I said, phase two will initiate a new focus on the identification and characterization of, of late adult phenotypes. By the end of this year, IMPC will have aimed to have made mutants and got phenotypes for a third of the mammalian genome. So that just gives you, I think, some perspective. And probably half of those genes, which would be somewhere around three or 4,000, will never, ever have been looked at before. So we really are getting a new window into um, uh, the mammalian genome landscape. So we have made a substantive step towards a comprehensive catalog of mammalian genome function. 
We've transformed the opportunities for rare disease and precision medicine initiatives. We're establishing the context and data for a new era of cross-species analysis between mouse and human, which some of you mentioned before. And we really do believe that this endeavor, uh, funded by the NIH and many other organizations around the world, will be transformative. It's going to transform our lives in terms of how we understand gene function and the role of genes in disease. Now, whereas I was able to put up a slide acknowledging everybody in New Mode, with all the names on there, that's no longer possible. Uh, these are all the major partners, the funding partners and the centers that are involved with the effort, all the way from the NIH uh, through to uh, Barcelona. Um, and uh, I should mention, can't find them. Where are you, Glad? Down there, the last one. The last uh, one. There you are. Uh, of course, Monterotondo here in Italy is, no, very good in is, involved with, um, is involved with the project as well. Thanks to everybody from around the world who's, who's contributed. Uh, and uh, I hope to come again at some point to Trieste and update you in a few years' time, where I think we'll hope to be close to having done half the genome. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.